think our family sometimes are just like, oh, I don't get it, I don't understand what you're doing. It was very difficult for my family to deal with. They could not understand why it was I was becoming a papist. We had certain family members that wouldn't let us be around their children, or my nieces and my nephews, for fear that they'd catch the Roman fever from us. It shocked them, it disappointed them, they prayed for me, they bound the devil, they did everything possible. They saw what was happening, were afraid, didn't want me to become Catholic. The Catholic Church was corrupt, evil, anti-woman. It's something that's hard to explain uh, to people that don't get it. Becoming Catholic is weird, you know? Weird. Why would somebody do that? I was always an atheist. I have no memories of believing in God or even wondering if God might exist. I, I never questioned that. To me, atheism, it, it just seemed obvious that it was true, and my dad and I really bonded on that. My nighttime reading with my dad alternated between the Nancy Drew mysteries and Carl Sagan. <laughs> he didn't raise me to be an atheist per se, as much as he raised me to seek truth and question assumptions. For most people converting to Catholicism, whether they're converting from evangelical Protestantism or secular modern outlook, requires uh, what we call paradigm shift, or you could just think about that as sort of requires a reconstruction of the very frame of assumptions and outlook that, that the person works with. People questioning the very framework of thought, the, the very paradigm that they're operating within, and sort of being open to having their basic criteria of what counts how do I think about things changed? And that's what uh, in philosophy of social science is called a paradigm shift or a paradigm revolution. That is, becoming Catholic in short requires a transformation of one's entire framework of understanding of things. And which is what makes it so hard for people that aren't Catholic or are not open to becoming Catholic. They can't even imagine sort of what you're talking about or why certain things would matter to you because they're just in a, living in a different paradigm. In college, I became just a loudmouth, obnoxious <laughs> atheist, and I remained that way. And then after college, I got a job at a high-tech company, and I met the guy who is now my husband. And it wasn't until we had been dating like three or four months when I found out not only did he believe in God, but he considered himself a Christian. And this was shocking to me because I thought, he's so smart. Like, smart people can't be Christians, right? I mean, that, that never happens. And people are often surprised that we could have been dating that long, four or five months before this came out. But what they don't understand is that even though I was technically an atheist and Joe was technically a kind of lapsed Baptist, he, he didn't pray, he didn't go to church or anything like that, we both essentially had the same God, and that was money and worldly success and, and having the right lifestyle. Essentially, we had our religion, and that's why you know, our religious beliefs honestly didn't come up very often. I always felt like I'm almost happy, and I will be as soon as I get that next thing. So we've got the travel, we've got the, the beautiful loft, but I just need to do this one thing in my career, and then I'm going to be completely happy. It was a never-ending quest for the one last thing that was going to make me happy. It's a very cliched phrase, but I think I would describe myself as a, um, you know, 18-year-old as spiritual but not religious in the sense that I vaguely felt a, a, a longing for something. I wanted some meaning. I felt like there had to be some meaning in the universe. There had to be. I just couldn't figure out what it was. Um, and so when I was, you know, my first, my freshman year at college, um, I was attracted towards sort of vaguely pagan things. Um, I went to the University of Massachusetts Amherst. You, you can get hippie pagan stuff there if you want to, uh, you know, posters about Yule and all that. And I, and I sort of was drawn towards that a little bit. I, I thought, I'm gonna celebrate Yule, and I, I went out into the woods and I tried to commune with nature, and I just 
got really cold and came back inside. Thought, oh, okay, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> People were pushy. They would say things like, do y'all want to be saved? Yeah. Saved from what? Who are you? What are you talking about? It, as a very reserved New Englander, it was exactly the wrong approach because it, it pushed all of my social buttons. And I, I just, I was just horrified. And so I thought, this is just nonsense. These people are crazy. Atheism is much more rational and it makes sense of things. And that's what I believe. And I felt as an atheist then, okay, if the world is meaningless intrinsically, then it's up to me to generate my own meaning in my own life. And there actually is a certain attractiveness about that, um, a certain kind of can-do individuality about it. The only problem is that it doesn't actually work. Um, that at a certain point, you, you have to realize I'm, I'm faking this, right? And then what do you do? So I did very well in school, full scholarship to college, uh, academic scholarship, in the honors program, et cetera, et cetera. So I had never had a need for God in my life. And that was one reason then you know, brought up not believing in God, did well in everything, didn't need God. There was almost no way or opportunity for me to even want to believe in God. That changed when I went to college started getting nervous in social situations. As I tried to overcome this, the, uh, this anxieties, nothing worked. Um, the self-help books I got didn't work. The little mental tricks that I had read that you could do didn't work. And I started to become frightened, like this is something that is going to consume me and, um, and ruin my life. Since I wasn't getting any better, even seeing the psychologist, I began to despair, to really lose any hope that even this professional person who's supposed to be able to help with this type of thing isn't doing anything. And driving to and from work, um, one day I uh, just saw in my mind that my mind's eye, if you will, this blackness, a complete blackness, the absence of all hope that my life is going to be one of constant pain and dread and fear it's never going to get better, and I want to end my life. As an atheist, you know, as long as things are going well, well, hey, I'm happy to be alive. This is great, you know. But um, I understood now, finally, why people did commit suicide, because they have no hope. And I was getting to that place of no hope whatsoever. Well, I remember when I was 10, I decided I was an atheist because I felt that religion was for B students and I was an A student and I was obviously destined for, for better things. And looking back, it seems like my, my whole life for the next, I don't know, 30 years was, was a series of insufficiencies. I tried to make a religion out of art, out of poetry, writing, out of drinking, out of other religious uh, traditions, Taoism, Buddhism, so forth and other, there was just that sense that, well, yeah, this, this ain't it. You're close, but this is not it. 60s, 70s, garage band pagan, I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just, um, I always, I was one of those, like a pagan, I, I, I believed that there was something behind the world, that the world is too mysterious, too beautiful to just attribute it to accident. But I also very much believe that you couldn't really know anything about what was behind the world. Uh, all the time that I was growing up, I was haunted by uh, an experience of intense longing for something that I couldn't put my finger on. Different things would evoke it, um, music would evoke it, or particular places. I, so uh, not far from uh, where I was raised is uh, a river called the Skagit River. I spent many, many happy hours on the Skagit River fishing. And sometimes, you know, I would have this experience of deep, deep desire for something. Well, what was I, what was I desiring? I couldn't put my finger on it. Uh, it wasn't the Skagit River, because I, was, I had that, I was right in the middle of it, uh, you know. And 
you know, all the all the lazy explanations. Wow, well, you you just wanted a girl. You know? No, uh, you know, I I got all those things later on, and that's not what I was looking for. I mean, that satisfied a particular desire, but not that desire. And that haunted me all the time I was growing up. The big crisis point for atheism came when I had a child. It, that was the moment when I realized that atheism did not really have a lexicon to capture the fullness of the human experience. I, I looked at my young child and I thought, okay, so what is he in a strict atheist materialist worldview? And I thought, I don't believe that he is just a bunch of randomly evolved chemical reactions that came from nothing and will return to nothing. I don't believe that the love that I feel for this child and that has come into my life since I've been married and since I've had a family is confined to nothing more than the chemical reactions in the human brain. One day I walked into a bookstore. I was not there to find anything religious. At this point, I considered myself agnostic and I thought that that's how it would always be. I'd begun dabbling in Buddhism because I live in Austin and it's required by law that we all dabble in Buddhism <laughs> at some point. And I, I never expected my religious exploration to go any further than that. And I saw this book, literally just kind of stumbled across it. I'd never been in the Christianity section of a bookstore or a library in my life, except for when I was in fourth grade. Once I went into the Christianity section and I took all the Bibles in, the, in our school library and I put them in the fiction section because <laughs> I thought I was so edgy. <laughs> so I'd never been back in the Christianity section since then. And I saw this book called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And it said that this guy was a former atheist. And I read through it and, and the author said, Lee Strobel said in the book, he said, I'm not trying to convince you to convert to Christianity on the spot. He said, I'm just trying to convince you that there is enough evidence for Jesus Christ that it's worth looking into a little further. It, it's worth exploring this. And at the time, I didn't think the book was perfect, but there were a few things that I thought were interesting. For example, he makes the case that you have this kind of lower class guy come from a lower class region. He's executed along with thousands of other people that year. And yet you see all of these Jews willing to give up these religious and social institutions that they had held onto for thousands of years through unspeakable persecution. And then it spreads like wildfire throughout the globe, despite the fact that not only was there not a worldly payoff to converting to Christianity at that time, it, it often meant persecution or even death, not just for you, but for your family if you converted to Christianity. And Strobel said, how do you explain that? And he said, you know, what we as Christians think is that those people saw Jesus risen from the dead. And I thought, maybe I should look into this a little more. I, I didn't think Christianity was true, but I was intrigued. <laughs> I moved to California and I had taken a new job. I was teaching composition and literature. And so I found myself revisiting the great poets like Dunn and Herbert and Hopkins and Eliot, the Anglo-Saxon poets, the Beowulf poet. And I thought, this is great stuff. Now, I thought to myself, ah, they're Christians and I, I, I don't believe that silly stuff. But I also knew, just as a, as a you know, English professor, this is really good poetry. So for instance, I was reading, in particular, John Donne's um, sonnet, Batter My Heart, Three-Person God. And I just felt profoundly moved by that poem. And that was the point where I thought to myself, okay, I don't believe what these guys believe. I don't. I don't want to believe what these guys believe. But maybe I've been a little too hasty in dismissing it as complete nonsense. Does God exist? That's actually the first thing we talked about. And it was actually relatively straightforward for me to conclude that some kind of God existed, some kind of first cause. The bigger step though was what Christians believed about this first cause, being personal, being involved with our lives, having 
a son who was incarnate. Okay, this is pretty weird. Um, but I realized that whereas the philosophical arguments had convinced me, the philosophical and moral arguments had convinced me that there was a creator, really the hinge of everything Christians believed was the resurrection. Because if this had actually happened, then Christianity was fundamentally true. And so I thought, well, let me see if I can find out if it really happened. I thought that it would be undeterminable, that it would be, well, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, you just have to believe. And I was really shocked to find that the historical evidence was really strong and really clear that this actually happened. And I ended up thinking, if I pretend that this evidence isn't convincing, I'm actually rejecting everything that my whole life I have held to be valuable, using my reason, using my critical thinking, um, following the evidence where it leads. If I was going to be consistent, I had to follow the evidence where it led, even if I didn't want it to lead where it was leading. And so I came to the conclusion eventually that, yeah, this happened. Christianity is actually true. Um, <laughs> At that lowest of the low point is when I finally thought, maybe there's an alternative to atheism. Maybe, in fact, atheism is not true and that God is true. And when I thought of God, I thought of Jesus because all of my friends were Christian friends, you know, who were, who were religious at all. And um, in them, if I was honest with myself, there was an authentic joy about most of them. There was a peace. And it was something that I, as an atheist, thought I had, but now with all these anxiety disorders and depression, realized I didn't have it all. And I longed for that. So I began to pray and say, God, I don't believe in you, but please help me if you're real. The anxieties began to lessen. They had gotten worse and worse. They started to lessen. And I said, scientifically speaking, this is interesting because they've gotten worse and worse over the past four years. What's happening? The only difference is I started praying. So I want to keep doing this to give God a chance. I still had a, it's impossible at that time, I thought, for me to believe in all the incredible stories in the Bible. You know, the miracles, the um, kind of outlandish claims of things that happened, you know, uh, throughout the Bible. But I said, I, I got to set aside those doubts and fears. Those have had their chance. Yeah, maybe it is all rubbish. Maybe it is. But what if it's true? And the fact that something's happening, I gotta keep trying this out. Atheism had its day. I'm giving this a shot. My faith was slowly growing. And at this point, it finally became level with the unbelief and began uh, to tip the scales. And that was a, a, the most exciting time, I think, in my life that had ever been um, when God sort of came rushing in and uh, the gates were thrown open and I really believed in God for the first time. My wife, being wise about my condition more so than, you know, a lot of the, the ideas that I had, uh, knew that I needed to get away. And she found this, this little advertisement in the back of Texas Monthly Magazine, Spiritual Retreats, with the name of this monastery, Benedictine Monastery. And at first I thought, no, you know, A, I'm not a Catholic, B, I know nothing about monasteries, C, I'm not a believer, I mean, this is wrong, this is a bad idea. But I you know, thought about it for a little while and I thought, well, could be interesting. So they invited me to, to church and I showed up and I went through chants, uh, prayers, and then this, this thing, this mass started. And I had never seen a mass. And I realized that even though I didn't understand what was going on, I understood the language because I had been writing poetry for years and years and I thought, I know this. This, this is poetry. It, it's scripted, it's written out, it's well-considered language, and everything they're talking about means more than the words themselves. That's just the starting place. This is a poem. Okay, I get this. I get this language. In fact, everything that I saw 
made absolute sense. You know, I looked at the monks and I, I looked at the way they lived and how the day was broken up into prayers and, and, and it, I, I thought, well, sure, this, this is not some artificial existence. This is a real world. And the, the days went by, I was only there for about three, but it began more the real world and the world back there with the cities, that was the one that I, I began to question, the one that was filled with these messages about what we need to make us happy. Everything I saw at the monastery was, uh, I think, what I was looking for. All these years, I didn't know it then, and I, I didn't even know it uh, when I left. But I remember coming back and my wife asking me about what the trip was like and so forth and other, and you know, we chatted and so forth and other. And then she said, well, are you going to Mass again? And um, I said, well, yeah. But inside I was thinking, are you kidding? Of course I am. When I got to college, I mean, my moral formation had more or less consisted of, there's the TV, look at it, do what it tells you, you know. So I did, you know. So I got to college in the late 70s and did what people did in, the, in college in the late 70s. Um, and consequently had uh, my first experience with my capacity for grave evil, uh, with my, it was really brought home to me how much of a user of other people I am. And at the same time that that was happening, I um, was running into, for the first time, uh, on my dorm floor, Christians who I, I respected. To my surprise, uh, I thought Christians were all you know, people with their eyes set a little bit too close together, you know, people who just, you just avoid it, you know. So more and more as I was struggling with my own capacity for evil and looking at these guys who were living joyful lives, began to trouble me and so I began to look more and more at the faith. But what really began to draw me in uh, was uh, encountering, and this has happened with so many converts, was encountering C.S. Lewis. He really made a conquest of me because he began, to my astonishment, uh, by describing his own experience uh, growing up in which he was haunted all of his pre-Christian life by this sense of deep desire, this sense of deep longing for something that he could not put his finger on. And when I read that, I thought, I thought I was the only one. And what he says is that all of our desires have proper objects. Uh, so we feel hunger, well, there's such a thing as food. We feel thirst, there's such a thing as water. We feel uh, sexual desire, there's such a thing as sex. Well, he says, if we have a desire for something that nothing in this world can satisfy, that things of this world will evoke it, but they're, the things of this world are not, don't satisfy it. Um, he says, consider the possibility that the universe is not a cheat, but that your desire is for something that is not of this world. That, that you're, this is an appetite, it's a proper appetite, but it's an appetite for God. And so, as I encountered Lewis, and he began to be able to put a name and sort of organize for me my life experience and make sense of it, uh, I started paying very close attention and so looked at, you know, what are the arguments, A, for the existence of God, which, you know, Thomas goes over, for example, and uh, what are the arguments for the deity of Jesus? For the resurrection of Jesus. I came away from that encounter with Lewis, with that church, with the New Testament saying, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I was raised as an atheist, my parents are both atheists, but it's just where I grew up, really the only active Christians I knew of were ones I saw on TV, a kind of moral majority. Katrina came to kill the gays kind of stuff. So I only saw Christianity 
in the political sphere when it was opposed to a different political policy position. It almost wouldn't have occurred to me to become an atheist blogger because I didn't think there was enough to say on the topic um, and no real reason to add my voice. You know, Christianity is silly, these policy positions are dumb, I don't need one more person saying that if you're not going to add anything. But what happened when I went to college is I actually met Christians. I met weird Christians and smart Christians through my debate group, uh, the Yale Political Union. And that was kind of really interesting because I went, oh, you know, these people aren't stupid, you know? And not that these people are right, but these people are worth rebutting. I should learn how to fight with them better because here are these totally interesting people, some of the math majors, right, who are embroiled in this very wrong idea. I should go in and save them on my horse. I actually got a copy of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity from one of the Christian ministries on my campus at college. They're very clever. They had a big table labeled free books, so of course I kind of went straight over. And I wound up picking it up, and it was really amazing reading the first couple chapters of Lewis's Mere Christianity in particular. Um, I'd only read the Narnia books beforehand, which I'd liked, but this was kind of the most perfect summary of what I'd already believed about how morality works. And it was really kind of both amazing and dispiriting to me to finally see what I'd kind of always thought laid out in print on the other side. <laughs> so one thing as I was studying Catholicism is I just kept being surprised by how many beautiful, bizarre things were tucked inside. But I thought of Christian as being kind of very boring, right? Uh, oh yes, Christ died for our sins. Well, what does that mean? And I started reading about it and I was reading about, I'd kind of been most familiar with kind of penal substitution. Oh, there's a penalty, someone has to pay it all tidy in the ledgers now, right? But then there was this other theory of it, Christus Victor, where Christ isn't just like paying the debt on our ledgers, Christ is destroying the power of death, which is already weird, so I had to find out what that meant. And what people are saying is, you know, well, like Christ, God passing through death, broke death. He found a way out of death for all of us into heaven because death just can't control, hold Christ. And I thought this is like a divide by zero error, right? You have this formula that we all go through and you put Christ in the middle and it breaks. And through that fissure, right? And this is what we see in kind of art of the harrowing of hell. It's a fissure created by Christ kind of going through a process that could not hold him. There's a way out for all of us. And I thought this was kind of both beautiful and insane. Um, and I've been struck by how many parts of Catholicism are like that where you wouldn't make, you, you almost wouldn't make this up. It's, you could make up almost the penal theory, right? Because it's just so tidy. It resembles kind of a human ledger keeping. But, oh yes, by like submitting to death and by entering Satan's domain, he, Christ was too large for it. it. Hell cannot contain him and thus it couldn't contain all of us if we followed him out. That's wild. That was, it was beautiful. And I don't know, there's a lively joy about it, right? I uh, went to Catholic school taught by fine Dominican nuns. Uh, we went to church every Sunday, but we didn't really talk about religion at home. It was just kind of more implied or taken for granted. So we didn't pray together. We didn't talk about the faith. I remember once in high school in a religion class, we had to uh, you know, do a project that involved using the Bible, and we had to go to our local Catholic bookstore, the Marion Center, to get one because we didn't really have a, a, a working Bible in the household. It was about in uh, my early to mid-teens, though, I went to attend a seminar by one of the world's top bodybuilders, a man named Mike Menser. And uh, I went with a friend of mine, and we were just mesmerized, learn, you know, learning the tricks of the trade from this guy because we knew in our hearts we were going to be Mr. Universe someday, too. But he also happened to be a very much an intellectual character who, in his muscle-building articles, also talked about the philosophy he'd been reading. People like Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist. You know, this is a guy who talked about the Superman, the Ubermensch, this bold man who goes out and takes what he wants and uh, has the idea that Christianity is for weaker people. Uh, things like this, which really kind of feeds into the mind of the adolescents, especially one who's all into weightlifting and power. So that had some degree of influence on me. me to 
read for the first time the works of St. Thomas Aquinas himself. And that's what had the, a major impact on me. It had all the impact in the world, really. I read that when Charles Darwin first read the books of Aristotle, uh, he had said that the people who were considered the gods of his day in science were like mere schoolboys compared to old Aristotle. And that was my experience with St. Thomas Aquinas. I thought these atheists I've been reading are mere schoolboys compared to old St. Thomas Aquinas. So that was my great aha by reading St. Thomas Aquinas, realizing that no faith is not unreasonable. Growing up Catholic, I was a, a, what I would call an average American Catholic boy in the 1960s, 1970s, and that is that we go to church every Sunday, we, uh, we say grace before meals, we say uh, Hail Mary and Our Father before we go to bed, we go to confession a couple times a year, and outside of that there was really no discussion about our faith and no, uh, no family attempt to go deeper to explain to you know, the kids what what this was all about. So I really didn't know my faith very well at all. And uh, as I look back and as I discuss this with my, my friends that I grew up with, they didn't either. You know, we just were kind of along for the ride. And uh, I think that the idea on our parents' part was that if we were along for the ride, it, it may be 18, 19, 20, we'd get our own Catholic car and keep, keep driving. And uh, I didn't. So we, uh, we went out in the car, and before I could get the engine started, this five foot two, 104 pound little beauty looks over at me and says, uh, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I'd never heard anybody talk like that before. Nobody's ever asked me that before, certainly not in the Catholic Church on Sunday morning, you know. And uh, I didn't know what to say, so I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm Catholic. And about a minute later, she said, uh, she came from a Pentecostal family. She said, do you speak in tongues? I didn't know what she was talking about. I'd never heard that before in my life. And I didn't want to disappoint her. So I said, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And I couldn't figure out what she was talking about, but I knew it was something spiritual. So about two more minutes go by, and I wanted to ask her a question. But by then, as a good Catholic growing up, I didn't know what tongues was. I, I wanted to ask her, but I couldn't remember if it was tongues or lips. I knew it had something to do with the mouth. It could have been gums for all I know. So I took a chance and I said, so, uh, so do you, uh, you speak in lips? And she started laughing and she realized that I didn't know anything of what I was you know, claiming that I knew. Well, that night she shared with me about her relationship. We went bowling, <laughs> of all things. She, she started sharing with me that night about her personal relationship with Christ. And I never heard anybody talk like that. And something about the way she talked and the affection she had for Jesus really spoke to my heart. And I realized that what she was talking about was what I was searching for. In all my books on Eastern religions and meditation and, and all of that, she was, the message she had and was living was what I was, what I was looking for. And so over the next uh, several weeks after school, I'd go over to her house and her mother would sit at the kitchen table and open up an old Schofield Bible begin to talk to me about a personal relationship with Jesus. Now at that point, I'm not thinking at all anything like, well, this isn't Catholic, or I gotta leave the Catholic Church, or uh, this is foreign. I just thought, here's a family that's really serious about this, and I, I'm not familiar with that, and I like what they're talking about. Make a long story short, it was uh, just a few weeks, and I was leaving her house and going back to my folks, and uh, it was about an 11 mile drive, and I got about halfway home, and I pulled over on the side of the road, I just started crying and I was 18 years old and uh, long hair, went to all the parties, had backstage tickets to all the major rock concerts, but and I was empty. And I was empty and I didn't have answers and I pulled over and I started crying and I put my, my head down on the steering wheel and I just said, Jesus, I said, I, I want what the Toblers have. Well, I grew up in a, in a Catholic home. Um, I went to Catholic elementary in high school, and uh, during my early teenage years, I kind of drifted away from the Catholic Church, uh, but I didn't drift away into unbelief. I drifted into evangelicalism, and it happened in a kind of peculiar way. Uh, my father had a friend who had visited him one evening uh, to talk to him about his own conversion and left uh, on my parents' kitchen table, one of those good news for modern man New Testaments. You know, the stick figures are in it, and, and I didn't know it was a Bible. 
uh, I opened it up and began reading after my parents had left, for, had gone to sleep, and I uh, was sort of moved by the stories about Christ. And I wanted to hear more about what this guy was telling my parents. I was only 13 at the time, and I called him up and asked him about what was going on, and he invited me to go with him to this Jesus People Church in downtown Las Vegas. I found myself drifting more and more away from the Catholic Church, not so much because I had become anti-Catholic, but because I found within this evangelical world uh, really serious people that were interested in these deeper questions. Now, as I've gotten older, I see that within Catholicism, there's this wonderful intellectual tradition. But growing up in the early 1970s, the impression I got at the time was the Catholic Church in America wasn't a very serious place, at least for somebody who was interested in following Jesus. Uh, I began then having doubts about my faith. Uh, I became a kind of, I think, emotional agnostic. And it wasn't until my senior year uh, in high school that I really began rethinking what I had given up. And I had one afternoon where I prayed. Uh, I, I asked God to give me a sign. And I had a radio in my uh, room uh, that uh, was on a rock and roll station while I was praying this. And then the radio station changed to the Christian radio station from the rock and roll one. Now, one of my friends said, oh, there's, a, there's actually a, uh, you know, a natural explanation for this. And I'm sure there, there was a natural explanation for it, uh, but it's odd that the natural occurrence would occur uh, roughly around the time in which I'm asking for a sign. So even if you, you could show that there was some kind of storm that helped my station or my radio to transition to this other station, the fact that it would happen to transition to the Christian station only moments after my making the request shows that uh, it, it may have not been a miracle that violated the laws of nature, but at least it was a coincidence miracle. So, yeah, that was really impactful for me. Well, I was born and raised in a Presbyterian church, and so from the moment I was born, we went to church every Sunday. We were involved with Sunday school, um, but it never really hit home for me growing up. You know, I knew the basic stories of the gospel. I knew who Jesus was, but... I would never say I, I knew him in a, in a real personal way. Um, so when I got to college, the guys at this campus ministry, this Methodist church on campus, uh, invited me to get more involved. So they started inviting me to Bible studies. They started inviting me to little prayer groups. And all that was terribly new to me. I'd never really spent a lot of time in personal prayer. I didn't really read the Bible at all myself. Um, so they started inviting me, and I, and I gave them every excuse in the book. You know, oh, I can't do this. I have homework. I have other stuff I got to do. But eventually, they wore me down. And after several weeks of invitations, I, I took them up on one just to go out to eat. And what I discovered was a wonderful group of guys who were generous, who were, had high character, who were sincere and welcoming. And I, w I was attracted to that. I wanted, to, I, I wanted friends like that. And so I kept hanging around them. And, and soon enough, they sort of pulled me into their small group where they uh, got together once a week to study the Bible. And it was then, I think, for the first time, I was really captured by the person of Jesus. You know, I was struck by his moral character, by uh, how sort of strange and beguiling he was. You know, I was very familiar with a lot of ancient literature and myth and legend, but there was some, some distinct characteristic about him that set him apart from all of those. There, there was, I'd never discovered anything like him before, and, and quite different picture uh, than the Jesus, the, the sort of felt bored Jesus I'd learned about growing up. You know, here was a Jesus who was, who was sort of dangerous and revolutionary and countercultural and evocative, and, and so all of that drew me into the scriptures, and I became enchanted with the person of Christ. good kid. I didn't get into much trouble and uh, went to college and, you know, I kind of 
I think played the part of this good Christian kid, but I definitely fell away from the foundations that I've been raised in and I uh, did, you know, probably a little too much partying and, uh, I, you know, a little too much going out, a little, not enough time in class. Um, and that was when, um, really, I, I really started to wander away from, from my faith. Not that I would have ever said I didn't believe in God or anything like that, but just, I just, I was not a practicing Christian. I was not at all. Um, and that was, uh, when I had my first abortion, uh, was during that time in college. That was, that was really kind of the, the beginning, I think, of my spiral away from Christ and, and away from my faith. And, um, and that's when I started working for Planned Parenthood. So I participated in this, in this abortion that was um, an ultrasound guided abortion and um, watched a baby die on the abortion, on the ultrasound screen. And uh, my job during that abortion procedure was to man the ultrasound probe, to hold the ultrasound probe on the woman's abdomen. And um, that was a Saturday. And the next day, Sunday, we went to our Episcopal church. And I was still really struggling. You know, I think people, they kind of make the assumption that, oh, you saw this abortion and, and you immediately had this change of heart and you just knew you had to leave. And that, that was not, that was not the case. Um, yes, I was troubled by what I saw, but I was also really trying to justify what I had seen because I did not want to leave my job. I did not want to leave my work. It was who I was. I was, I was a pro-choice person. That was me. That was my lifestyle. And so I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave all that behind. So I was really trying to justify what I had seen. That Sunday, the the gospel that was read that day was from Matthew. And it was the verse that talks about if your hand causes you to sin, better to cut it off. And um, my hand that day, my right hand, I guess from holding on to the ultrasound probe so tightly, I mean, because I, I was stressed during the procedure and I was really hanging on to that probe, it was really sore. And, uh, and so I'm just <laughs> sitting there, you know, I'm hearing this gospel and I'm like looking at my hand who's been aching me, you know, that's been aching me all day. And I'm just thinking, okay, you know, okay, God, like, I guess you're trying to give me a really clear sign from you, you know, word from you. And I tell people, you know, even though I, I, I started going to this really pro-choice church, essentially trying to run from God and run from his teaching and, and run from his law. Um, you know, in the end, I just, I couldn't run fast enough. Like he caught up with me in this crazy pro-choice liberal church, you know, and, and that, that's what happens. I mean, when we, even when we stray, you know, away from his path and, and this perfect path that he set for us, even if we stray from that, he's still there waiting for us and he can still catch up with us. And that's, I definitely found that to be true in my life, just sitting in that, in that church that day. So I was intrigued by Christianity, so I bought a Bible. I grew up in the Bible, but I know you buy Bibles if you want to know about Christianity. I had no idea which one to get, so I just chose the one that looked least like a Bible. It had a plain black cover. I expected the New Testament and the Bible as a whole 
to be kind of all like the Ten Commandments. I thought there would be some action items, some bullet points. I thought it would end with a call to action. Like if, if you're convinced by this book, you know, here's what you do next. But it was all stories. I was so baffled by this book. On the one hand, I, I was intrigued by this figure of Jesus Christ. I was, I was intrigued by this Jesus guy that I was reading about in the Gospels. But I was baffled as to what I was supposed to be doing with this information. And I certainly didn't know how to interpret it. You know, the, there's, there's the story where the, the rich guy is told that he has to give away everything he owns to follow Christ. And I'm looking at my laptop thinking like, really? Everything? I mean, can, can I keep a few things? And so I would ask Christians online and they'd say, oh, huh, no, Jesus was just talking to that one guy. You can keep your laptop. It's fine. But then I'd read the Mary and Martha story and, and you know, where, where we learned that you're supposed to put the Lord above, you know, trivial things. And they'd say, oh, well, no, that story was for everyone. And I thought, where is your answer key? Because <laughs> I, I think I'm missing some sort of interpretation part of the Bible at the back because I don't know how to interpret these verses. And I certainly did not see a clear case for the Christian moral code in the Bible. I had questions like, you say that your religion doesn't believe in euthanasia. I don't really see a biblical case for this either way. And so they would come back. Well, first of all, one Christian would say, oh, yeah, euthanasia is okay sometimes within a Christian worldview. And here are the scripture verses that back up my claim. The Christian over here would say, oh, no, we think that euthanasia is a grave evil. And here are the scripture verses that back up my claim. I saw this over and over again. Christians constantly disagreeing about what the Bible says, but they would be, both be convinced they were right. And they both had script, scripture verses to back up their claims. And again, I heard these statements like, well, we Christians can agree to disagree on, on what our moral code says. No, you can't. Because if you say that this God you worship is the source of all that is good, then you do not have the luxury of disagreeing about what is good. So I go onto my blog and I say, guys, your religion is totally bunk. <laughs> I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have all of these Christians out there who are worshiping different Jesuses. They, I, I try to ask them what the most basic moral code is. And you have all these different propositions of what Christians believe. Everybody has scripture to back up their claims. Guys, your religion is a hot mess. I mean, you even have to admit this. It doesn't make any sense. And so I'm not, I'm, I can't ever become a Christian. I'm not going to be exploring this religion anymore. I thought the response was going to be uh, along the lines of them saying, yeah, you're right. Do you have directions to the nearest Buddhist temple? <laughs> but it wasn't. So all of these people who I did not realize were Catholic came back and said, maybe there's another way. They said, what if before Jesus went up to heaven, he founded a church, just one church, that he instilled with his own authority. And just like he did with the writers of the Bible, what if he took imperfect people and used them as tools to convey perfect truth? And I thought, yes, yes, that makes so much sense because that would explain how people can come to know God who are illiterate or who have poor reading comprehension skills. That explains how people could find the, the reliable truth about Christianity before the printing press. They could find it through this church. It also explains, you know, I'd, I'd seen all of these different ideas about who God is, but if there is this one church and it does have his own authority to answer questions about who he is and what he stands for, then yes, you, you can get one answer to that simple question, who is Jesus Christ? I said, yes, this theory, yes, yes, yes. And they said, that's Catholicism. And I said, no, 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 like, I can't become Catholic. What am I insane? There's no way. But I was stuck because that was the only viable option within Christianity. I didn't see another way this religion could work. I think some of the reasons why Protestants especially become Catholic, uh, American Protestants, 
There's a whole variety of reasons, but there are some themes that, that, that go along with this. And one is uh, a realization of just how fragmented and internally chaotic American Protestantism is. You know, there are thousands and thousands of denominations. The adherence of each one thinks that they have the truth or that they have the correct interpretation of the Bible. And uh, if you start to think, Americans are very used to this sort of denominationally fragmented s religious society, but if you start to think about it a little while, you think, well, it can't all be true. It can't all be the right interpretation of the Bible. And, and so that creates a, a kind of a doubt, like, can't we have a more definitive or authoritative uh, understanding of what Christianity is? In the town I was living, there was actually a, a street called Church Street. It was called Church Street because right there were five or six different churches, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, um, each group meeting in their own building, not talking with the other, not knowing what they believe. I thought there's something fundamentally wrong here. And what is it? It was very ironic because actually um, the practice of Protestant ministry started to push me toward the Catholic Church, although I wasn't aware that that was what was going on. So I'm working in a downtown neighborhood of perhaps 4,000 people in. Uh, within that area, there were over a half a dozen different Protestant missions or churches that were active, you know, with, with pastors doing door-to-door -door evangelism and so on. And um, we would get together and talk about our doctrinal differences. We would have discussions about this. I would have my texts from Scripture. They would have their texts from Scripture. And we would reach a stalemate. Um, when I talked to these different pastors, I just realized that Scripture alone was not enough to get us past our, our impasses. We, um, we had our own presuppositions, and um, if, if it was the case that Jesus had just left us with the Bible, uh, this was obviously a system that wasn't working. I'm kind of what you'd call a Protestant mutt uh, in the sense that uh, you, know, you have some guys who are purebred, they're in one denomination or they're one kind of a thing before they became Catholic. I kind of span the gamut. So my father was a Methodist pastor and then he became a Pentecostal pastor. So that was a big shift there. Then there was a church split as so often happens and we ended up in the Bible church. Then they put me into a charismatic church after that. And then I went to a Calvinist high school while I was going to this charismatic church. Then off to Oral Roberts University, I graduated from a Swedish Covenant University. I've been in Assemblies of God, I've been in the Baptist Church, I mean, you name it, and I have been there in some way, shape, or form. And really, this was kind of the, the impetus, I think, uh, for my move into the church, because I got to this point where one night some friends and I were talking. We didn't normally talk about theological subjects, I assure you, we are normally talking about girls and sports and things like that. But one night, for some reason, we're talking about baptism. And we were deciding, you know, is it necessary for salvation? Uh, is it sprinkling? Is it immersion? Is it adult? Is it infant? And while we could quote some scriptures uh, to back up our positions, it quickly became apparent that we didn't all agree with each other. And uh, this finally dawned on me, a very slow wattage bulb because I'm kind of thick-headed. But uh, I said, how in the world are we supposed to know who's right? Because there must be a right answer to this question. God is who he is. It doesn't matter what I believe about him. So how do we know who's right, especially on a topic like this, which is so important? And someone said, well, we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. And I said, yeah, that's true. And you got him, 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 and I got him, and we all disagree. So this authority question is what started to rear its head. And it started to bother me at this point in time that the Calvinist high school that I went to, for example, would teach something called double predestination. So you are predestined to go to heaven or to hell, didn't matter what you do. But my church was saying something completely different. You could choose, you had free will, and yes, you can backslide and fall out of salvation. And so it started to bother me that I couldn't reconcile these things. How did I know who's right? So the authority domino was really the big thing that started to push me toward the church. The just me and my Bible uh, ethos of evangelicalism is certainly attractive, but then you start to see the dangers of it because all of a sudden you see people going off in directions that you think are kind of kooky. Who's to say that the guy who wants to handle snakes in the pulpit to prove that the end of Mark is real uh, is wrong? Where do I come off faulting them when they're saying that this is what they think the Bible teaches? 
it's just a he said, she said kind of proof text war um, with no with no end to the spiral. It doesn't there's no there's no way to resolve it. What I eventually figured out was that in order for authority, church authority to have any kind of meaning, uh, it has to be traceable back to the church that Christ founded. In other words, you couldn't just say my church is authoritative because it's most biblical, because every single church you visit is going to claim to be the most biblical. Like, why else would you believe what you believe unless you think it's right, unless you think it's biblical? But every competing denomination and every competing claim uh, insists on its own scriptural basis. And so that makes testing um, any claim to authority or any claim to, to you know, a, a biblical position or, or a theological position impossible. And so I, I, I figured out eventually that, like, if there's a church that speaks with authority, it has to be one characterized by apostolic succession back to the apostles and not by my agreement with it and its biblical claims. And, you know, I eventually concluded that that church is the Catholic Church. Um, but way before I even got that far, I knew that whatever church is right, it has to be able to make that claim for me to take it seriously. But as I was studying philosophy and theology, I began to realize that there are divergent understandings of Christianity. People have different takes on who is Jesus Christ. They have different takes on what is the church. And so this really began for me a quest to determine which of all these representations is the one true faith. And that awakened within me this desire to know, well, who were the early Christians? I'd always loved the Bible, but it, it never really crossed my mind that there might be people who knew the men who wrote the pages of the New Testament. Right? What, were there people around who knew St. John or knew St. Paul? And what did they say? So when I, when I discovered this, I realized, now here's the ticket. Like, if you want to find out what authentic Christianity is, you just got to keep rewinding the script and go back to the fathers, which is what I started doing. As you go back in time, as Blessed John Henry Newman did, when he originally intended to try to refute the Catholic Church, this is when he was a, an Anglican minister, so he wanted to write a, a refutation of Catholic teaching, and he began to do his historical research, and he realized no matter how far back he went, he found the Catholic Church. And little by little, what happens is we could do the same thing. If you go back in time, all the groups that you know today, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Calvary Chapel, the whole Protestant phenomenon and all the rest, all of them, if you go backward in time, eventually cease to exist because they came into existence long after the church that Christ established. But the Catholic Church, and I would include the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox churches as well, it can be proven, historically speaking, to go all the way back to the time of Christ and the apostles. That's a mind-blowing reality, just as it was for Blessed John Henry Newman. He wound up converting, and uh, very much like, like him, so many people today do too. Uh, this young Catholic boy grew up to be a Protestant minister in a thriving church, in an exciting church. But there was one thing that was always nagging me, and that was, Jeff, how do you know that what you're saying is true? Or is it your own interpretation? Or is it uh, someone on television, their interpretation? Or a commentary's interpretation? How do I know that I'm, an, I'm bedrock? How do I know that this is what Jesus intended? This, how do I know that this is the church that he intended? As I continued to study in a, in a fairly serious manner, the early church fathers, uh, I started to notice that the, the look of the early church and the content of their teaching did not look like mine as an independent church and it, uh, it brought about a crisis in my life. And that was, if, if the church that I'm pastoring and the message that I'm proclaiming is inconsistent with the first 400 years of the church, what am I doing and where did I get it from? And that was a crisis. They sounded really Catholic and this really disturbed me. It wasn't so much what the fathers said, but what they didn't say. So. The issues that divide Protestants and Catholics today, things like apostolic succession, the nature of the Eucharist, 
the sacrament of penance and justification or how we get saved or how we're transformed into the image of Christ as Catholics would look at justification were kind of assumed to be true. So there, was, there weren't a lot of arguments for like apostolic succession because nobody doubted it. <laughs> so when Irenaeus writes against heresies, one of his arguments uh, is, well, these heretics don't have apostolic succession. But he just says it as if like, everyone knows that's right. So that was the kind of stuff that weirded me out. It was like, whoa, the reason why you don't find a lot of explicit detailed arguments about these issues is that everyone just assumed they were correct. Couldn't stay where I was, didn't know where to go, um, didn't know what to do, so I did what a lot of people do when uh, they're in a state of confusion, uh, lack of clarity, uh, maybe even in a bit of a, a funk or a depression, and uh, I applied to graduate school. I got down to Notre Dame and one of the first men that I met there, in fact he was the, the tour guide for incoming students, uh, he had three qualities I never thought I'd find in the same person. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, highly intelligent, and Catholic. And I didn't see how you could all be through all three things at once. Uh, so uh, so I, I had to meet with this guy. To my surprise, he was able to answer uh, almost all of my objections from Scripture, and I had never met a Catholic who was able to defend the Catholic's faith from Scripture before. He even carried a New Testament with him, and I remember trying to press him one day on Mary, Queen of Heaven, and he pulls out his New Testament, turns to Revelation 12, the vision of uh, the woman um, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, the, the crown of 12 stars on her head, and he begins to exegete this passage, pointing out the parallels with the Blessed Virgin, showing that this woman in Revelation 12 gives birth to the Messiah, and that's an obvious parallel to the Blessed Virgin. And so how can we deny that there's, there's the possibility that this is an image of Mary in Revelation 12, at least in some sense? And it was, all, it was making a lot of sense. It was, it was very logical and step-by-step. Step. And, and I thought, holy cow, you know, Marian doctrines from Scripture? I thought that was impossible, you know? He was, he was doing, uh, you know, miracle backflips uh, in front of my eyes that I thought could not be done. Going and getting my Christian apologetics degree at a Protestant university really did a lot to help me become a Catholic. Every time a doctrine would come up in, in a class, I would read the Protestant perspective, and usually multiple Protestant perspectives, um, often very divergent. And then I would say, okay, well, what do the Anglicans say? Um, what do the Catholics say? What do the Orthodox say? And I did that consistently for three years as I did this. And it was wonderful because it allowed me to have a bigger picture. Um, I, I knew that I was growing intellectually. But I also found, as, as time went on, that the Catholic view just always ended up making more sense. I began exploring the Catholic moral code. I began looking into the church's explanation for what it is and what it does. And I found the most internally consistent belief system I had ever encountered. I also found it, that it was imminently reasonable. I, I thought it was going to be all this fairy tale mumbo jumbo, but it was so reasonable. And I, I once heard a great analogy where, where this philosopher said that find that Christianity is like the box top to the puzzle pieces of life, that it, it gives you the box top that helps you put the puzzle pieces together. And that is exactly what I had found. All these new friends that I had made in the pro-life movement were uh, coincidentally Catholic. And my, <laughs> and I'll never forget, uh, Doug and I were having this conversation one day and he said, you know, you can just tell them we are never becoming Catholic. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, don't even think about it. They're going to try to get us to go to mass and do all this Catholic stuff. And it's just, it's not going to happen. And, um, and I thought, okay, you know, <laughs> okay, you know, whatever, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I wasn't even thinking about becoming Catholic, but, um, I remember one Sunday, we were supposed to go to this church, and um, we were, I don't know, we messed up the time, and, and we didn't get there in time. And so I said, well, 
there's mass at St. Thomas Aquinas down the road. We could, we could go there. And, you know, he reminded me again, we can go, but we're not becoming Catholic. And so um, we went, and I think for both of us, it was just kind of this feeling of peace. And, I mean, it's hard to describe it, but it really did feel like, this is where we belong, just from that first moment. And um, we left that day, I think both of us feeling confused, because I think we both expected to walk out and go, oh, I can't believe it was Catholic. You know, I mean, I think that's kind of what we expected to have that feeling, but yet we both walked away from it going, wow, that was really beautiful and really powerful, and that felt right. I found myself increasingly convinced that Catholic theology just understood things better, especially the implications of the Incarnation. God became man, and the Ascension ended up being more significant than I realized, because I thought, wait a second, this is dead obvious, but our Lord still has a body. He didn't give it up. And with that context, I started to see that the Catholic understanding of the sacraments made so much sense. Because if God became incarnate and interacted with the world in himself, you know, the second person of the Trinity, it, it made sense, it was consistent that he would continue to act through the materiality of the world. Um, in fact, it made a lot more sense than to think that he sort of dusted off his hands, so to speak, and said, all right, See ya, I'll be back. But you just think nice thoughts and pray about me till then. <laughs> so we had this problem, you know, she was Catholic, I was Protestant. We were trying to figure out what church to go to. And it, it was then I realized I've really never given Catholicism a fair shot. She was the only Catholic I knew. I didn't know anything about Catholicism. And so I thought, you know, out of love and respect for her, my future wife, I, I should at least check it out. So. I spent a while researching, uh, several months, I, I poured myself deeply into books on Catholic apologetics. I went into the Church Fathers, which many of my convert friends will readily agree is a big mistake if you're hoping to avoid becoming Catholic. Um, and, and I quickly discovered that the Church of the first century was the Church of the 21st century, developed through time, but the Church today is the Church that Jesus Christ established. And really for me, the hinge was the real presence of the Eucharist. Um, I had fallen in love with this Jesus. I knew that I wanted to devote my life to him. So I was startled by the extraordinary claim Catholics made that in every Catholic mass, Jesus uh, comes to us body and blood, soul and divinity. And I realized at that moment, I, I crave for Jesus. I want Jesus. And if he's in every Catholic church, how could I stay away? So um, I, I really researched this because I felt like this was sort of the crux of the the issue. Uh, I read John 6 in light of many interpreters, you know, uh, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. I went back to the church fathers and tried to determine what did they say about this? You know, St. Paul writes often about uh, the body and blood of our Lord. What did he mean by this? And it, it seemed to me after all this research unavoidable that what the Catholic Church teaches today about the Eucharist is what the early church believed and taught as well. That when the words of consecration are spoken in Mass, that the, the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. And that to me was the closing uh, argument. I, I realized that even if I didn't have everything else figured out, if Jesus was present in the Catholic Church, that's where I gotta be. And so it was all sort of downhill from there. For me, the process of conversion was a, uh, a very interesting sequence of experiences. On the one hand, as an evangelical Bible Christian, studying sacred scripture was for me everything. And so I felt like a detective going through all of the clues that I could find in the Old and New Testaments to really come up with the most coherent and compelling vision of all that God had done through Jesus Christ. Uh, however, reading the early church fathers led me as a detective to clues I never expected to find and conclusions that really changed the detective story into something like a horror story where all of a sudden I realized that the Catholic Church, which I had opposed, I had misunderstood and I had misrepresented. 
And so suddenly all of these things that were coming true from sacred scripture were converging with the vision that the early church fathers were giving to me of the Eucharist, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and of other saints, and the sacraments, and the sacramental organism, which nothing was nothing less than God's own family. And so at that point, the humiliation, the shock, and the fear, all of these factors became so real to me that it's sort of like, what am I doing? How can I stop? But I couldn't. And then finally, that third phase was for me almost like a love story where suddenly I am seeing that this is what God the Father has done. This is my family. The mother of Jesus is my mother. These saints are like older siblings in the family of God. And so, you know, instead of just simply being scared, I was swept off my feet and recognizing that the truth of God's word was even truer than I thought. And that the good news didn't get any less, it got even greater. You know, it's just sort of like the gospel in high definition. There are many reasons why people don't want to become Catholic. Almost all of them have to do with some misunderstanding of what the church actually says. So most of my job as a Catholic radio host is to disassemble misunderstandings and explain that actually your first premise is false and here's why. When you let the, the Catholic faith out of its box, it has a life of its own. It's resonant, it's beautiful because it's true. And so uh, we just encourage people to go back to the sources, go to sacred scripture, crack open the catechism. You cannot read a paragraph of the Catechism of the Catholic Church without running into a Bible verse, and then it'll send you to a footnote, which is usually another set of Bible verses. Bishop Sheen famously said that there are millions of people who hate what they think the Catholic Church is, but not a dozen who, th who hate what she really is, which is a very different thing. I tried for about six months to read myself out of the church. I was looking for anything. I felt like if I could find one area that they were absolutely wrong on, that I could save myself the trouble of knocking on the Catholic door. In that six months, I looked at Mary. She was a real problem. I looked at the veneration of saints. I looked at purgatory. I looked at every issue that I could possibly think that I thought that the Catholic Church was wrong about. The problem is I had never really read Catholics about those things. I had read what Protestants said about what Catholics believed, and it's quite different. <laughs> so when I started to read actual Catholics, I realized that their view of Mary was not what I thought it was. And um, the first time I went to Mass was about the time we had decided that we had to, you know, we needed to make this decision. And I was surprised that Mary was not mentioned in Mass. I was quite sure they were gonna roll out a statue in the middle of Mass and, you know, all kneel or something. I didn't know, you know. In the end, it's kind of funny how Mary was a stumbling block. I get it, but, you know, this gentle servant, uh, be it done unto me according to your will, do whatever he tells you. This is not really a stumbling block kind of character when you investigate her more thoroughly. It's not what the church teaches that is outrageous, it's what people think the church teaches. That's the outrageous thing, right? And I had come to realize that I had been buying into myths about the church rather than accuracies. The big one for me was Mary. Mary was the hardest thing for me to move into the church. But the moment in time uh, that I really was able to accept her as my mother took place while I was in the final stages of my RCIA process. And I would pretty much decided I was coming to the church. And it was very difficult for my family to deal with. They could not understand why it was I was becoming a papist. And my father was having a particularly difficult time because I think he thought I was turning my back on my family. I was leaving my tradition. So uh, he was not talking to me for a while. We, we were very distant in our relationship and it was painful. And uh, I, I was working at Franciscan University in the public relations department and this guy that I worked with came up to me and said, listen, can you cover, cover my holy hour for me? And I said, sure, what's a holy hour? And so he explained what the holy hour was and I said, okay, you know, that sounds great. What time? 2 a.m. 2 a.m., you know, who does a holy hour at 2 a.m.? What's wrong with you Catholics? But I'd already said yes, so I had to do it. So I went down to this church at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of winter. And of course, I'm the only one in there because who else is gonna be in there at 2 a.m.? So I kneel down to pray. And I'm kind of wondering, what am I gonna do in here for an hour, you know? And I'm a little tired and I'm kind of looking around. And as I look around, 
I see this statue of Mary. And I knew all the theology of Mary at this point, but what was here had not gotten here. And that's what needed to happen for me to fully embrace her. And as I kneel there and I'm looking at this statue of Mary, I'm like, you know, you're kind of stalking me, aren't you? And as I looked into the kneeler in front of me, there was one of these little plastic rosaries. And so I picked it up and I'm looking at this rosary and I said the prayer that so many converts have said, Lord, don't strike me dead for praying this rosary. And I said, all right, Mary, here's your shot. I'm gonna give you a chance here to prove to me that you really are my mother and you care for me and you are what the church says you are. I need to know this. And so I said, my, I'm gonna throw my fleece out like Gideon. My relationship with my dad is my intention. I want reconciliation with him. So I prayed that rosary with that intention. And that was 2 a.m. At 2 p.m., so I'd gone home, I crashed, I woke up, the mail came at two o'clock in the afternoon, and there was a letter from my dad asking for reconciliation. And so I said, all right, Mary, I'm done. The last kind of hurdle for me was Mary in some ways. And I was at the point where I could agree to the intellectual teachings of the church on Mary, but it was like, you know, the journey from here to here is like a long way. And uh, about 10 days before we were supposed to enter the church in December of uh, 1987, I get a call from Sherry. She's working at Harborview. They had brought in a girl. She was 18 months old. Uh, she was on the burn ward. She w and she had third degree burns over 90% of her body. So she calls me and she says, I think that we were supposed to pray for this girl. And look, if we're going to do this Catholic thing, then we need to fish or cut bait. So, you know, the church says that we should ask for the intercession of the saints, including the Blessed Virgin. So are we going to do this or not? I thought, yeah, okay. And I thought, all right, look, God, your church says that it's okay to ask for the intercession of the Blessed Virgin and the Saints. I feel really weird doing this, and if I'm doing something wrong, then please tell me and don't strike me dead. Sherry had the same sort of feeling. She went down to the cathedral, she stood in front of the Mary Shrine and said a Hail Mary for Sarah, and then she said she ducked out before the lightning bolt struck. So Sherry goes home for the weekend. The doctors are saying it'll be amazing if this girl survives the weekend. She goes back to the room to pray for Sarah, and she walks in there, and the bed's empty. And she's like, so she goes out to the nurse on the floor and says, when did she die? Uh, and the nurse says, oh, no, she's not dead. She's downstairs. Sherry goes, what, did they transfer to another floor? She says, no, she's down in the playroom. She's playing because all of her skin had spontaneously regenerated, and she did not require a single skin graft. So, so Sherry, call, Sherry calls me, tells me this, right? How do you respond to something like that? You know, we both just sat there, right? And the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I thought, okay, well, prayer to the saints, I guess that's okay, you know? I'm often asked that question, why did you become Catholic? You know, it's such a strange and counter-cultural thing to do today. And I always respond the same way that G.K. Chesterton did when he was asked why he became Catholic. He said that the difficulty in explaining why I became Catholic is that there are thousands of reasons which all ultimately amount to one, because Catholicism is true. It is true. It's true. I found it to be true in the big and small things. Because I truly believe that that is where the truth is. What I had concluded, almost against my will, was that, that Catholicism is true. All this is real. The truths of the faith, the things that the church teaches, are not just theories, they're statements about what the universe is really like. Three words, truth, goodness, and beauty. We have a natural desire for truth. Aristotle said this in the fourth century BC, all men desire to know the truth. So if you want to live by truth as opposed to falsehood, everybody at least should have the intellectual honesty to investigate the Catholic Church. The second one is goodness, and that is goodness both to know what is good as opposed to what is not good, and also to have the power to live it. The third one is beauty. There's nothing more beautiful than having God in your life. 
And that's something you can tell a person, but they can't really know until they experience it, where God becomes the center of a person's life. And that reality is in the Catholic Church. God loves us and wants us to be a part of His family. What I found in the Catholic Church is that family. It's the family of God that, that God established for our salvation. It's the Ark of Salvation. It is an unruly place, to be sure. Uh, it is a lot like the Ark in many respects. It's not a clean and tidy and odor-free environment, that's for sure. But it's the Ark of Salvation. Another way of looking at it is it's, it's the one body on, on the planet Earth that provides you the most resources for getting the closest to God as possible. This is finding the pearl of great price. I mean, to be Catholic is the most, it's really the most beautiful thing that you can do with your life. Being received into the church and then receiving communion was experientially different. And it was as if, especially, especially the Eucharist, as if, a veil was pulled away, um, as if I was finally really touching, tasting, experiencing. And I felt, for the first time, I really felt experientially the fullness of grace in my whole self, intellectual, emotional, spiritual, physical. It's just amazing. It, it's it's entering into the fullness of the Christian life in a way that I certainly didn't expect. Um, and it's just, it's by far the best thing I have ever done. When people ask me, why would anyone become Catholic? There, there are two sides of me that want to answer. One is the old atheist side that has a very simple answer that just says, because it's true. And then there's the other side of me, that, the sort of fun-loving side that, that, that says, because being Catholic is the most full experience of the human life. Sometimes people ask me if my life is better or worse now that I'm Catholic. And I, I never knew how to answer the question. And eventually I came to see that that's because it, it was the wrong question. It's, it, it's not that my life is better or worse now that I'm Catholic. My life has started now that I'm Catholic. Tell me, God. 